Hello, this is Dave Habris, the CEO of uh, TPA uh, Global. I'm here with uh, Fischia, and we uh, will address today the, uh, the, the trends in, uh, in MAP procedures and also the, uh, the recent uh, developments in, uh, in the arbitrage um, when MAPs don't resolve uh, uh, your problems of uh, double taxation. Um, uh, for personal reasons, uh, Professor Hans Moy cannot be here, uh, uh, but we'll uh, take the honors, and we uh, we have been uh, quite successful, I think, in uh, giving you a good program. So we're we're going to be looking at what what um, controversy instruments um, people could be using, uh, and we are going to be putting and linking them to a, a value chain analysis perspective. So some parts of the value chain need a little bit more, uh, are expected to deliver more disputes with tax authorities than others. And we're going to look at the transactional versus uh, bundled entity approach, um, look at uh, the benefits towards the dispute, uh, the, the dispute manage, management, and how um, till today these instruments have been used uh, successfully or, or in particular cases less successfully. Um, as we all know, the um, Action 14 of BAPS hasn't been particularly successful in, in bringing a lot of uh, resolution to the table on the MAP uh, process and, and making an, uh, an effective, uh, proposing an effective um, tax resolution program. Um, so we're going to look at how the, the OECD has repaired that through uh, uh, the M MLI, uh, which makes the, the structure quite complex, but I, I think we try to put it down to a, a simple version. Then the, the, the main question, some of you are online office, how does this all help me when I'm working in a corporate? So how does that help this MAP procedure help you to resolve disputes and, and through arbitrage also help you to resolve double taxation uh, in the end. And, and uh, Avisha will close with two, uh, two, uh, 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 two cases from, uh, from, uh, from practice in, uh, in India and Denmark. So that's, that's roughly the, the program and I, I think we're ready to go. So this is the uh, the, the list um, where we, we say, okay, you can approach uh, disputes with tax authorities in, in a traditional way. So you, you wait until trouble comes up. Um, you maybe have a discussion with a local tax inspector, but you try to avoid being proactive um, and you're trying to avoid to discuss it with too many um, governments and tax authorities at the same time. So the traditional way has been to wait for um, um, an IDR, an information data request. You're going to respond, you're trying to delay the whole process, uh, and you're going to get resolved on a, a country by country base. If you don't get result, a resolution, you go to the local courts. Well, we, we believe that, that the way BAPS has injected a lot of economic thinking um, in in the way you allocate profits uh, amongst uh, your your group entities will will trigger a lot more disputes than in in, in the past. So a, a, a more proactive approach to um, to these disputes, where probably you need to start communication in in multiple jurisdictions at the same time will be the, the way forward. So we, we do, and that's what we displayed here, um, you do um, unilateral reactive, then through tax audits you, you end up in local courts. If you do a more proactive approach um, and you play the game on a multilateral level, uh, the, the, the MOP uh, procedure is, is one of the instruments which is available. Um, uh, multilateral uh, APAs, uh, bilateral APAs, multilateral APAs is another one uh, looking forward. Um, and, and there's some safe harbors. There's also the whole area of, still the area of unilateral and proactive, uh, which is the uh, unilateral APAs, although 
if you do that in the European Union, obviously you have to assume that any APA you close with tax authorities will be uh, put in this big EU database where tax authorities uh, of other countries can look into as well. So this gives the um, the total box of uh, controversy instruments, and each one of them is um, positioned on on a timeline and on a one country uh, or multiple country type of approach. So this this is sort of setting the scene as as uh, we we will dive into the the map in particular. Before we do that, on, on the next slide, we say, okay, what what is your approach on use of these instruments depending on on um, your value chain? So if you do a value chain, and some of you might not be 100% familiar with value chains, if you say I have a value chain where I I run um, a company who owns a brand, who owns technology, um, and um, who is also the matchmaker between supply and demand, um, the, the, that company should get the residual. Um, I have some production units, they should get cost plus, and I have some sales entities uh, who get a, a, an operating margin, and have, I have some services which, uh, which are allocated like headquarters, shared service centers, and, and BU-specific uh, service centers. And I have some other uh, royalty um, uh, income, uh, interest rates, etc. So if I carve out each of these steps in the value chain, I need to start thinking which instrument is best suited to defend my position in, in each of those steps in the value chain. So if I Take, for example, the, the services starting at the bottom. I would say the services require a defense line, but if, if I have safe harbors published by the EU, uh, the ATO, the IRS, uh, and even the OECD, maybe I should just rely on, on that percentage and, and not um, look any further. Or I have a, an ISO certificate which I can use where it says this is the cost base. The cost base is consistently charged out, um, including the markup, gives a reasonable fee for the benefit the subsidiaries get from those services. So that's almost like a very carved out, very isolated ring fenced risk uh, where not a lot of profit is moved across territories whatsoever. Um, if I move to the top and I see the residual, so the matchmaker who also owns, owns the brand and owns the, the, the production and process patents, um, who gets the residual obviously has will have an interaction with all the other players in the value chain, so it's not doing that in isolation. On the contrary, it's the, it's the spider in the web and, and therefore will gain all the losses uh, the residual losses or all the residual profits and, and therefore is mo much more volatile and therefore much more vulnerable to disputes with tax authorities, especially if you plant that residual, assume it's a residual profit in a, a tax-friendly location to the extent that that is also coinciding with the way you run your business. Well, then there might be much more need for <clears throat> closing um, bilateral, multilateral APAs, and you might want to uh, deal uh, a lot with uh, with um, multi-country uh, map pr procedures. Um, so if if the residual, say, is planted in Switzerland, and Switzerland has a sales entity in in Holland or in France, and you might say, okay, I, I want uh, a bilateral APA for future years. I still have some open years I, I want to resolve, and I'm going to because I I have a dispute with uh, with the tax authorities in France because they're eager to tax some of the Swiss um, uh, residual profits. I'm going to start a map procedure for uh, open years in the past to resolve that issue uh, within the boundaries of uh, of how I also want to move forward uh, with a bilateral APA. So this is taking the box of instruments and, and, and uh, in a very conscious way, 
uh, defining your risk appetite and locking the, the value chain components in with one or more instruments you're going to be using to manage that risk. So this is uh, the very structured way we, we see uh, controversy management going uh, in, into the future. If we take that to the next level and we say, okay, so how do you communicate to the board? And that's the next slide. Um, then uh, you could tell the board that the value chain gives you the total profit um, in, in your company. Then you have um, uh, documents, TP documents, as well as tax returns, which support transactions um, and, and the transfer pricing rules around transactions. Um, th th those storylines need to be in sync uh, to have a good solid case. So let's assume that is, then in, in that scenario, you, you run probably less than 10% uh, of, of a risk that tax authorities come to you and say, well, you had this cost plus 10 on services, you had 5% on royalties, and you had 8% on interest, but it hardly leaves any profits in my French subsidiary. Uh, so apparently you've done the transactional thinking, but not the holistic thinking. Um, and, and that could trigger um, another layer of disputes. But assume you have looked at the whole value chain. Assume the transactional storyline is in line with how you slice the pie from a holistic perspective. Then you should be able to, through negotiations or mediations, uh, resolve most of these disputes. Only in a few cases, um, if, if you're not really well prepared and you allow this this sort of dispute uh, to escalate to a level where both parties can't really resolve the issue anymore, not even uh, through MAP, not even after MAP, through, through arbitrage, uh, then, then obviously court is the only way out. And, and I, I guess what we will be addressing is that uh, going to court or at least Making the move to courts doesn't exclude you necessarily from following parallel the map and and ultimately the arbitrage um, road to a, a resolution. And so this is an uh, another way to tell to the board of a company uh, with some probabilities aligned aligned. This is how it ultimately works out in terms of uh, a total risk management. Uh, uh, perspective. Taking that forward, um, th then the, the big question always is, uh, what is tax risk and, and how does it get expressed in the, in, in the books? Because that's, at the end of the day, if the CFO of a company is interested in tax, they also want the probability of that risk with a number attached to that. So you, you have the following slide, which uh, is, is illustrating a little bit the the way uh, P&G, Procter & Gamble, took, uh, took uh, out APAs in, in 17 countries. And I think it took uh, them almost eight years of negotiations um, with a lot of bilateral APAs in, included. Uh, they had a uncertain tax position in their books uh, because they were not sure their reported position was was going to be honored by the tax authorities of about four billion. And through this whole um, series of uh, of bilateral APAs uh, with some map procedures inclusive to to uh, resolve old years, they were able to bring back their um, their total tax provision in their books uh, to uh, to 500 million, um, and and that's sort of the game you're you're looking at. Uh, you have um, reported income which is uh, uh, taxed. Well, you know, then it's reported and it gets taxed. So no one's really uh, uh, in 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 that uh, discussion. But if it's reported and not taxed, then you would talk. Uh, about uncertain tax positions. Um, so that's the tax provisioning game as we know it from an accounting perspective. And to some extent, and that's what we found in uh, especially your country by country reporting, um, the, the, especially the lines stateless entity and stateless income, 
um, did trigger some uh, some eyebrows being raised by a few people at our end, but also even at the client end, uh, especially in, in if and in so far that stateless entity and that stateless income was also not reported in one of the other countries. So this is the the whole appetite for risk. Uh, the the bigger uh, your X is in this picture, the more you, you report and you believe you reported it in the right jurisdiction and it gets taxed there. Uh, the the bigger your Y, the the more appetite for risk you seem to be having, and um, after one or two uh, dry runs with your CBCR, you hope to have not too many of these uh, stateless entities and stateless income items. Uh, so uh, if your appetite for risk is, is relatively modest, you would uh, expect the Z component not to be there at all. Uh, so, the, so this is an, another way of, again, looking at, at risk. Okay, um, I think there is a, an option also to share with us through the, the box um, you have in front of you some some questions. So at this moment, there's no questions, but feel free to, to raise them um, if you have uh, any questions. And then we move uh, from that, that broader picture we just painted uh, in terms of risk management and, and MAP being one of the instruments um, arbitrage being the subsequent instrument uh, and how that all relates to your reporting and your value chain. We're now moving to the next slide where we um, are looking a little bit at, at uh, the map and uh, if the map doesn't work, uh, would that be an arbitrage clause? So a map is great. It's an Article 25 model treaty. So you have a, a problem uh, and you hear you get you get into a double tax position and you want to resolve um, um, a tax dispute, then you can file a map under 25 uh, model treaty. Um, and, and the specific treaty, obviously, between the two countries should, uh, should uh, uh, facilitate that, but they typically do. Uh, then one of the authorities is going to contact the other authorities. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean your problem is resolved. It means they're going to make an effort to, to get it resolved. Um, big challenge here is that uh, we see uh, tax authorities taking five disputes to the table, say Belgium Ministry of Finance and the Dutch Ministry of Finance is sitting around the table to discuss a couple of MAP procedures. And they will give, uh, the Holland will give in to Belgium on one, but want something back on the, on the other side of the table. Uh, that means you, you your file becomes part of a horse trading exercise. Um, that's that may be even the the better option because at least it gets resolved. Um, um, a lot of the map procedures do do tend to stick in the pipeline, as we see a little a little bit later, uh, quite for a long period of time and. You know, there's always going to be a certain period um, of, of waiting uh, if you if you take the transaction and ultimately you get into a map procedure that already takes a couple of years. If then you have to wait and, and nothing gets resolved, and you need to get into an arbitrage, and even uh, with arbitrage, there's a certain time frame involved. If I would go back to the previous slide, suddenly your your uncertain tax position, your Y position is is going to be blown out of proportion compared to what you you get taxed on and, and reported. So there is a um, from an in-house perspective, resolving cases within a reasonable time, and sometimes a reasonable time is the same quarter. Well, that's not very realistic, but I, I, I recognize. But the the time horizon of people in-house to resolve these cases gets um, less and less time and, and doesn't expect three to six to nine years to have to wait for resolving double tax uh, cases and, and at, at, during that whole period building up layers of uncertain tax positions in, in your tax provision. 
So if we look at, at this slide, it tells you a little bit the history of, uh, of how Article 25, uh, the, the MAP procedure also deals with, uh, with uh, an arbitration clause. Uh, so we looked in 2013, when the BAPS project started, there were about 160 treaties which included this arbitration clause. Um, only 63 had a, um, a, a, a Article 25, uh, Section 5, Paragraph 5, providing for mandatory and binding arbitration. Um, and, and the remaining only had this, this effort to, to resolve your case. Uh, while you as a taxpayer were not party to that uh, negotiations and potentially being subject to the, the horse trading game I was mentioning before. So what happened? BAPS came to life and then they suddenly found that they had to do something for taxpayers as well, not, not only for tax authorities under the BAPS. So they found Action 14, but there was no consensus in uh, Region 14 uh, about the um, suggestion to move towards a mandatory binding arbitrage because they recognized that BAPS would trigger a lot of different interpretations, would lead to much more disputes than ever before. Um, and somewhere they need to also balance uh, balance the interest of, of corporates in that, that whole game called BAPS. So what, what they did is, uh, in the final report in 14, they came up with a minimum standard uh, for improving the effectiveness of MAP. And apparently, if tax authorities say that, 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 that their, their implicit notion is that they were guilty of not providing such an effe effi uh, efficient and effective version of MAP in the first place. And we, we get to that later. Um, however, the the man, minimum standard uh, still uh, in 2015, again, did not include the mandatory binding arbitrage. And, and also the lack of transparency on positions governments took on, on how, what their position was, how, how much they were favoring a mandatory arbitrage if MAP would not be successful was a very, um, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty much a dark room. So no, no one knew what the Ministry of Finance in Berlin or, or in other locations were thinking in terms of uh, how positive they're working uh, and, uh, in, in MAP procedures to really resolve the case at hand and avoid a, a multinational a taxpayer has to pay double or triple taxes on, on the same profit. So that that was not very sad, satisfactory uh, in 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 the final report on, uh, in October 15. So what what they uh, that, that that result uh, that resulted in the in a sort of subcommittee they've created in uh, in drafting the MLI, where suddenly the MLI. Is uh, has as as uh, section six has a mandatory bi binding arbitration clause added, but as an optional provision. So they created a subgroup who, in the light of uh, drafting the MLI, uh, not in in action fourteen because they they failed uh, to to get that consensus and and uh, on the on the mandatory binding arbitrage. Most most governments believe. This binding arbitrage uh, erodes their sovereignty, so so they don't like it. So they they say tax is ours and uh, he, here to stay. So they don't like suddenly some arbitrage is taking place where where a, a group of arbiters is is taking a decision on on a taxable base where where they feel they they should be calling the shots on. Uh, so that the the emotions are clear. But uh, it, it was also clear that Action 14 uh, w was not doing what it's supposed to be doing, and therefore the MLI was uh, was the way to resolve it. But again, it was only an optional provision. Um, and uh, very important, it allowed the states to make their own reservations uh, on the, the coverage of the types. Uh, so they, they could make 
various reservations, and we, we show you the table a little later for the ones who signed the MLIs at the same time took the option uh, to go for mandatory arbitrage, but yet uh, even that, that small group of, of, uh, of countries could still make reservations on which cases they didn't want mandatory arbitrage to be applied. So that, that brings us, and I'm passing, uh, I'm, I'm giving the floor to Afisha now on, on the next. Afisha? Uh, thanks, Jeff. Right, so uh, we've heard what changes have been proposed by the OECD or what was and how much they have, how far they have come along to fulfilling the intentions uh, of actually resolving disputes. Let's do a, just a small recap of what the old Article 25 was, what changes BEPS Pro Action 14 proposed to make, and what changes were finally implemented through the MLI, and how will they be implemented through local countries' adoption of the MLI. So the old Article 25, uh, did provide for mutual agreement procedure resolution as well as binding arbitration, but the MAP access was limited to was provided in limited situations, which the OECD has tried to has tried to broaden by through its actions in BEPS Action 14 as well as the MLI. For example, some treaties did not include Article 9 Clause 2, which refers to corresponding adjustments being made by uh, one state or the other when dealing specifically with a transfer pricing relating this related dispute. So if your treaty with another country did not include Article 9-2, just by virtue of and because Article 25 wanted to co was covering all disputes arising under the convention, and if the convention did not include Article 9-2, the disputes that were arising because of Article 9 were not covered by uh, the taxpayer. Basically, did not have access to map on those issues. So. Now, OECD did try to make some changes to it. What were these changes? BEPS proposed some minimum standards to be observed. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit more in detail after, but just to briefly provide an overview, one was expansion of all types of cases that are to be covered, such as inclusion of Article 9.2, even if it does not find specific mention in the treaty. Next, uh, con next intention was the countries should ensure that administrative processes promote prevention and timely resolution. One best practice proposed by Action 14 is for a conversion of these mutual agreement procedures to bilateral program, to bilateral APS, which could hold certainty for the taxpayers for upcoming future years as well. But as since it is a best practice, it is not part of the minimum standards. It is just a proposition by the OECD, which countries are not bound to accept again. And uh, next, again, one of the best practices named by the OECD under BEPS Action 14 is they suggest countries to have not just bilateral, but also multilateral maps, which touches upon the point of in improving taxpayers' rights by providing access to bilateral or multilateral maps and conversion of such agree such procedures into APS that can hold certainty. However, not much has been seen in the adoption of con in countries' behavior towards adopting these principles. Uh, why we say this is also, if we look on the next slide, what has happened under the MLI? Best Action 14 provided for some recommendations, which the OECD put under part five of the MLI which is a de minimis provision of the MLI. So if you sign the MLI and, you're, and uh, you have a covered tax agreement with another uh, country that has also put the agreement with you as a part of the covered tax agreement, then the provisions of the MAP articles will invariably apply. However, since uh, the same is not applicable for part six, which is the binding arbitration country and states are allowed to choose their reservations as as they as they please pretty much instead of having a standard list of reservation which was the initial intention of the OECD but because they thought it was not be possible to have a consensus on the types of reservations so they allowed all states to make all reservations so now that we say 26 states have 
accepted that they will mandatorily use arbitration to resolve map disputes. But if you look at the table on this slide, it's the list of reservations already limit the scope back to old Article 5, which did not provide for map access under certain situations. For example, we look at exclusion 14, which says exclusion of cases relating to dual resident purposes, so which is Article 4, which is uh, quite a cornerstone of the model tax convention. If disputes related to that are not covered by the map proceedings and therefore the arbitration proceedings, that does put a hindrance on the extent of rights the taxpayers can seek to implement in its talks with the competent authorities. Um, yeah, if you if you see 15 as well, if we share the, the Portugal says, uh, I only want arbitrage to be mandatory on Articles 5, 7, and 9, because then that's what I can oversee, and I, I think that's what most of BAPS is about, so uh, no hanky-panky on any of the other articles on bilateral treaties I have in place. And if you, if you see that France, Finland, and Germany uh, are sort of in, uh, leading the table of, of, of uh, uh, scoring the highest number of reservations, uh, all each of them five. And I think I, I tend to agree with uh, with Avisha. It's 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 pushing um, uh, governments into um, a, a consensus over time. But at this stage, I think the not having the consensus on Action 14. Uh, on the on this mandatory arbitrage in in 2014 and in, in 2014 is is still reflected. Um, uh, I was very optimistic when I saw the more than what is it more than 100 uh, countries now signed the MLA. I believe we get we get to uh, sure. and and that that Hi. 20 26 states and maybe uh, a few more uh, by now have uh, signed up to the to the mandatory arbitrage, but. I, I was sort of disappointed seeing seeing this list uh, of uh, of reservations. Again, it, it's moving in a certain direction, so uh, we we need to stay positive on that. But it does carve out the and does uh, this is a reservation on scope. There's are also reservations on timing, and and some other reservations which are made on top of this. Um, um, so so this is not uh, the only reservations. Mm -hmm which are, are being applied. The funny thing is if, if and to the extent um, a country makes a reservation, say Portugal makes the reservation and only applies to five, seven, and, and nine, then the other countries who sign up to this clause can, can um, disagree with that, can object against the reservations, which makes it kind of complex. So you have, you're signing up to something, then you make a reservation basically uh, uh, taking your uh, your, your uh, signing up to something back, then the other party, and there's a, there's been one state, Japan, um, has objected against the reservations made by Australia, Canada, Finland, France, Ireland, and Italy and Singapore, which is quite a long long list. But Japan is the only one that basically means that the opting in for this mandatory arbitration clause is being eliminated and you go back to the original uh, 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 tax treaty. Uh, so the objection by Japan on these countries and the tax treaties Japan has with these countries means the mandatory arbitrage is not in place anymore. You go back to the original treaty. Is there any questions? Let's take a quick look. I think so as of now. Uh, in case you guys have uh, started uh, using either map or in case you're hesitant to use maps, uh, please feel free to let us know what are your hesitations against use of map as well. Because OECD is promoting um, the use of map through, to resolve your disputes and therefore it is trying to improve its dispute resolution mechanisms in terms of map, such as it's put in some peer review mechanisms uh, to make sure countries adopt to those minimum standards as well as uh, try to resolve disputes in a timely manner but in the past it hasn't been so and if we look at the numbers on the current slide they also don't, don't, don't present the most rosiest of pictures which shows that 
the total number of disputes, that total number of map applications that were filed since 1st of January 2016, only a, only a fifth of those have been resolved by now, that is by the end of two years, which the map had, pro which the OECD under Web Fraction 14 had promised that everyone would resolve disputes uh, within a time frame of two years from the date of filing or provide for a provision for arbitration otherwise. But if we see only one fifth of those cases have been resolved, yeah, it's a slightly better trend than presented for cases that were filed before 2016 when countries had and expressed this intention to uh, try and resolve disputes through MAP. But the outlook can still seem quite bleak to a lot of corporations, which is also why we promote the use of risk management and dispute avoidance instruments over resolution. But in case you've tried to, in any country, uh, act, try to access MAP or have act, tried to approach a competent authority, have had a discussion with any of uh, your advisors uh, regarding application of MAP to you, please uh, let us know your thoughts and opinions and also the hurdles that you faced in that respect, perhaps. Yeah, I think the, the the what what we what we try to capture in the in the slides a little bit is there's an attitude problem with ministries of finance. They they don't really like to give up sovereignty, so they're not uh, uh, they're not putting a lot of money aside to to build up capacity in the map space, uh, particularly because if they do, then obviously they they uh, if they don't, they at least have the excuse I don't have enough capacity to resolve all these very complex cases. Well, they're not all that complex. And if you see the, the backlog of uh, 8,000 uh, maps, um, you, you understand why making the map procedure more effective and efficient uh, was the minimum gesture they needed to be making to, to the business community. Um, irrespective of that, I think if you if you Resolve on that 1500, uh, 1496 cases started for January 1, 2016. And a lot of multinationals are following the roots of uh, Procter and Gamble these days, where they say, um, on on the more valuable portions of my value chain, I'm going to do, go for bilateral APAs for the future. When I still have open years, I try to. If, if it's not easy to resolve it on a unilateral basis, I go for a MAP procedure in the countries which support my uh, position of, of a reasonable settlement uh, and resolving uh, the case in such a way that it, it stays close to the agreements on the transpising setup uh, uh, agreed uh, upon in the bilateral uh, APAs. So we do see the appetite I think uh, it's it's time for governments to wake up and, and say, okay, let's facilitate that appetite because it, it, it also el eliminates the uncertain tax collection at the level of the tax authorities. I, I think it's time to s sort of say, okay, sovereignty is, is one, but also the uncertainty of, of collecting a certain amount of cash is... is uh, is worth something. So if I have the cash in my hand today, that's that's different than uh, I have a dispute and I have a million of cash, which uh, which this taxpayer needs to pay me. But you know, it takes nine years to get that resolved. And uh, there's some uh, procedures uh, tax authorities put in place to get the cash earlier. I understand that, but still, it creates also uncertain tax collection positions in the books of uh, of, of tax authorities. Okay, let's uh, move on. Right, so this slide, we uh, just want to revert back to how does the uh, how does the provisions of MAP, which form a minimum standard that are applicable to everyone who who do all uh, covered tax agreements of the MLI. So, as um, you might already be aware, MLI tries to uh, change or replace or uh, or substitute the articles of existing bilateral treaties to harmonize the intention that intention of avoidance of double taxation. It does so in four uh, broad manners. A clause proposed in the MLI might might be put in place of an existing clause, or it might 
apply to or modify an existing clause. These uh, these examples, these uh, situations apply only when there exists already a provision, and both countries of a cover tax agreement have expressed an intention that this is uh, that this clause exists in their existing treaties. So the MLI clause then replaces it. In case such a clause did not exist, if you were using these two phrases in place of or applies to, in case a clause did not already exist in the bilateral treaty, the MLI clause will not be put in place or in um, absence of. That comes with the third one, in absence of, even if your tax cover tax agreement did not have a provision providing for a relief provided through MAP agreement, through the MLI, using a clause in absence of. So if you, are, if you have put your agreement as a cover tax agreement and you're dealing with a clause of the MLI that says in, that applies in absence of, it will invariably apply to the cover tax agreement. And the last one, in place of or in absence of covers everything. So if you had an existing clause and you have indicated this to be a part of your cover tax agreement, it, the MLI clause replaces that. If you did not have it in your cover tax agreement, the MLI clause still applies. If you had it but the same intention was not um, being accorded to it, if same intention or meaning was not awarded to it in the double tax agreement, in the cover tax agreement, the MLI clause replaces that as well. So what we see in the part five dealing with the map resolution, the MLI says the first part that the taxpayer has access to map in both contracting states. Earlier it was only in the state of residence, now it is both contracting states. That provision applies in place of or in absence of. So if someone has put their cover tax agreement as a part of the MLI, they have to for sure provide access to the tax map access to the taxpayer to both contracting jurisdictions and all the other articles of um, uh, of relating to map res uh, map access are also in place of or in absence of now, this clearly shows an intention of the OECD through the MLI to really enforce these uh, map access rules however the same intention does not get conveyed when they talk about man in mandatory arbitration, which is in part six, the whole part six in itself optional. And even as Steve was saying just a minute ago, even if you have accepted it, but you have made a reservation and your corresponding country does not accept that reservation, the whole part six of mandatory arbitration does not apply in respect of that agreement. So it's it's clear the the OECD tries to to use the, the soft push towards governments to have um, uh, them put this map access uh, clause in the treaty or through the MLI injected into the treaties uh, or uh, a combination of both uh, with the intent to at least open up the governments and create more consensus that the map procedure actually is a basic right of a taxpayer. Uh, mind you, the, the, the taxpayer is not a, a party to a MAP process. Uh, you can request it, but then the governments go and sit together to resolve uh, the issue you, you've been putting on, on, their, on their table. So it's, it's a soft push on step one, MAP access. It's not um, by any means a soft or a hard push on mandatory arbitration, which would be needed to have a certainty to resolve your case of double taxation if the map procedure um, uh, not in a soft way led already to some resolution. Right. The next slide we already briefly covered what are the minimum standards uh, proposed by Web Faction 14. So let's move on to the next slide which talks about what are the minimum standards for authorities' proper conduct. So we would have discussed that in the past, the map uh, map access has been limited or the resolution has taken a long time for the taxpayers or at the end of it, there is no implementation mechanism in local countries. A wide variety of reasons have been historically present that have stopped taxpayers from utilizing map to its fullest potential. So again, OECD does try to 
put a little bit more pressure on countries by asking them to make their dispute resolution profiles public in the four uh, under four broad categories they want countries to put their what their legislation says as well as what has been in practice in their country observed in the last two to three years so what has been the pra legislative practice and the country practice if different in terms of preventing disputes in terms of availability and access to maps such as is it accessible in all cases covered under a model convention, uh, sorry, tax treaty related disputes, or is it really selective? Next is resolution. What happens after a map agreement has been reached, but what happens, what does it mean for the taxpayer? And after resolution, what does it mean in terms of real implementation? Uh, this has also to be looked at in against the local court regulations of various countries, whether the local courts consider the map agree, map, the decision reached under map to be binding on them or not. These, can, these differences exist from country to country and OECD has not has proposed that there should be quick resolution, there should be implementation, but mechanisms on how to do it have been left to the states to decide for themselves. and. As we've discussed before, multiple issues prevent state, states from deciding in a very harmonized manner, such as state sovereignty claiming a higher share of tax and the list of reasons why states may not want to decide in the most in the most favor of taxpayers can go on. Uh, yeah, the, the, just just a, a, a point here. Um, if if we look at uh, the practices by the um, mid-sized and larger multinationals, so we, we, we would say that at least 25% of the multinationals, uh, the, especially the bigger ones, are are very much in line with Procter & Gamble trying to get bilateral APAs and resolve through MAPS uh, any unresolved issues. Uh, why? Because there's a pressure by the CFO on their um, XYZ position. Uh, the provisioning slide we, we introduced to you in the beginning. Um, I, I guess if they would make the map, uh, and that's basically the peer review process, uh, has been successful um, in, in, in countries like Mexico on, on acceptance of the OECD guideline standards, and subsequently Mexico became the uh, point of reference for a lot of other Latin countries, and this all has been uh, the achievement of the OECD who through a peer review process to see whether Mexican government was in line with OECD guidelines in uh, w again with a soft push got Mexico to accept uh, the, the OECD guidelines in the first instance and what we see now with a lot of BAPS elements um, uh, through the so soft push a lot of La Latin countries embrace BAPS even earlier than in some European countries uh, so we, we, we are quite positive that this peer review process is opening up, is creating transparency on what the, the position of governments is by just checking their behavior. Uh, how well are they uh, dealing with maps and how proactive are they dealing with maps? I think if I ask my clients, uh, about half of them would like to go and resolve uh, through bilateral APAs and, and MAP procedures on, on, on uh, um, existing years open their, their tax position because they need to report to a stakeholder who doesn't like risks. Uh, so, uh, but, but, but that's, that's uh, really, I think, the drive. If tax authorities would be more open and this peer review process is really trying to push it in that direction, then also a higher percentage of uh, at least my clientele would be willing to consider this uh, as, as a reasonable option. Okay. Um, yeah, this is the, the, looking at pure from a corporate perspective, this would be your, your checklist with some European flavor to it. Uh, but, but you could, you could uh, if you have operations and you have a dispute with any tax authorities, say in Europe, you would look at local remedies. Um, you would need to look, uh, based on our earlier slides, whether the access to MAP is, is there. 
um, and and can you combine it with uh, bilateral APA uh, where you where you agree how the the transfer pricing is going to be organized uh, in the future and and have MAP resolve any outstanding years. Um, in in the worst case scenarios, can you get uh, an EU arbitration convention or um, do you have uh, as a as a closing to the map if the map doesn't resolve the issue a mandatory arbitrage clause in the in the bilateral tax treaty and uh, then the big question from the CFO always comes how certain is it that we will eliminate double taxation and and uh, in the case of Procter and Gamble we we showed you the the real money numbers uh, it, it, it looks like a big jump on your uncertain tax positions and and that has an immediate impact uh, on the on, on potentially your stock price as well so uh, tax is a risk and people like to eliminate it if if the the road to eliminate it is uh, relatively easy and has a high probability of success i think that's that's sort of the uh, simple way corporates are looking at it so the, bringing this back to reality this is sort of the questions you need you need to be answering your uh, you need to be asking yourself and and probably get asked if uh, if someone else in the, in the in the company asks you what is this about um i think we have two cases which were published on a map uh to just to show some side shoots on uh, how courts in countries are looking at uh, map processes uh, maybe Afisha? right just to briefly summarize um this is a case in, uh, from India, where there's a corporation called eFans Corporation. It's a company uh, that is engaged in the business of making electronic payments or facilitating ATM payments, etc. And uh, it was uh, providing some IT-related services uh, to local clients in India, and those contracts were through its um, through an indirect subsidiary of that U.S. company. Now, they had a dispute uh, over whether that subsidiary formed a permanent establishment for the U.S. company or not. And through a mutual agreement procedure, the IRS and the Indian Revenue Authorities came to a conclusion, came to a conclusion that uh, there does exist a PE. And that was done because in order to end long going, ongoing litigation, just to end the dispute, they, the two authorities agreed to do so. However, when the dispute was going on in the local court, the taxpayer, the revenue authority wanted to use the conclusion derived in the MAP procedure to say, in the MAP, it was decided there exists a PE. Both countries have agreed. The same conclusion should come out of a local court as well. The taxpayer, of course, contested that in the local court because the MAP outcome saying that there exists a PE in India was, of course, not very favorable for the taxpayer. So that's where challenged it and ultimately the taxpayer did win because it was decided by the court that the determination of whether a permanent establishment exists or not is a matter of law and matter of local law primarily. When the when the taxpayers take access to MAP, that MAP resolution was specific to that particular year in which which it was given or the years ever covered in which it, the map decision was given and it was given with an intention only to end the litigation or the dispute at that time it does not conclusively uh, provide an answer of whether or not double taxation has existed or has been eliminated or whether a PE existed or not so this case sort of goes on to highlight that even if map procedures are made super efficient and everyone and all countries are in line with the OECD's mandate of making it easier for taxpayers, even if you do get a map resolution, unless it can be converted into a bilateral APA that can be rolled to the forward years, providing certainty on the same issue for a few more years, if it is just providing certainty at international level, that you will not get claims against the other by the other state on that income for that period, it does not give you certainty how your domestic courts are going to treat it, which is to us quite a big limitation of MAP, even if it were to be very efficiently applied. Um, 
Another case is uh, from Denmark, which presents a which presents a hurdle faced by the taxpayer. In fact, which OECD tries to resolve through its new action, new Article 25. In Denmark, the taxpayer uh, taxpayer chose to close down a factory and. Uh, basically restructure its business from being a profitable entity to being a service uh, entity almost. And this led the revenue authorities in Denmark to dispute, uh, to apologize, uh, this led the revenue authorities in Denmark to increase the taxable income of the taxpayer, which was of course disputed by the taxpayer. But the, reven the issue here was the revenue authority did not in a timely fashion give arguments to the taxpayer as to why they had increased uh, the taxable income and they kept asking taxpayer to provide further information. When the taxpayer tried to apply to the competent authorities in Denmark, the revenue authority objected to such access on the grounds that they had been asking the taxpayer to provide information for the last two to three years. But since the taxpayer had not provided information as According to the view of the Danish tax authority, the taxpayer had lost its right to present a case before the competent authority, which must be done three years from the date of existence of a dispute. So basically, the, the Danish authority tried to restrict access to MAP. However, in the end, the Danish High Court did decide that uh, the revenue authorities cannot block uh, access to MAP on such a frivolous ground. However, OECD tries to remedy the situation by saying that if uh, the local tax authority, local competent authority in your jurisdiction of residence does not allow you to file for a map access, you can do so in the other contracting state, which was not something that was available through the wordings of the OIT Article 25. So these two cases go on to present uh, some benefits, some incidental benefits that can trickle down to corporations if and insofar the MAP procedures can be made uh, very efficient. But it also goes on to at least lead to client, uh, corporates to ask a question whether and if they invest so much time into resolving a dispute through MAP, what does it mean? What level of certainty does it bring for them in terms of relief from double taxation? Okay. Well, thanks, Avisha. Uh, let's see whether there's any final point um, of closure. I think uh, map and access to map is essential, uh, but the more essential is what instruments in totality do you use to support your value chain and how pieces of your value chain get reported into your tax uh, tax returns. Um, I think the the peer pressure, peer review pressure the OECD is putting in place is a good uh, good notion and a good way forward to, to get a higher uh, number of maps, uh, which are, is triggered each and every year, uh, resolved. So we're still not at the fast lane of map procedures. So you typically would see them being used in uh, combination with uh, bilateral um, and or unilateral APAs and, and to resolve uh, open years. I think with that, uh, thank you very much for uh, for um, your at attention and your presence today. And um, we will be, just as a pre-announcement, uh, as TPA Global doing another webinar by the end of, uh, of, uh, of January. I think it's the 31st on the U.S. tax reforms. Uh, so any one of you being interested, uh, please uh, register yourself. And uh, thank you very much for uh, today's presence.